Wie man sich das denn braucht? Our cultural subculture and grassroots movements spark new developments that create lasting impact in cultural science and innovation. Within this framework, we look at the development of Berlin and Los Angeles in that context through presenting selected initiatives in both cities. The presentations serve as a starting point for discussing similarities and differences in the urban development of Los Angeles and Berlin, and we want to identify opportunities of how to learn from each other. It's my great pleasure that I get to present to you today's speakers and panelists that will share with you their stories on the topic of urban creativity. We have um, on my right Paul Rockenmas, a US journalist and author of the book Berlin Calling. Um, to the very right, Anja Pelitenko, creative rebel and uh, chairman of Berlin based cooperative of, uh, for urban creativity. <laughs> um, in between Anja and Paul, we have Mario Houston, chairman of Berlin based Postmark TV and CEO of ECRA. To the very left, we have uh, Tom Gilmore, real estate developer and cultural philanthropist that um, most of the people in Los Angeles know for his, for his great achievements in downtown Los Angeles. Between uh, Tom and me, we have Eric Espinosa, urban strategist and special advisor to LA Mayor Gassetti. My name is Christian Rauch, and I'm the director of State Festival, and I have the pleasure of hosting this one. As a uh, before we go into the discussion of the topic, we would like to contribute a few stories that each of the panelists and speakers prepared with you, for you. The first story that's presented is going to be the story of Paul Optimus, and I'm, it's my great pleasure to introduce him to you in a little bit more detail. Paul Optimus is a wilderness writer who has been working in, in Europe since 1989. His work appears in the nation, foreign policy, foreign affairs, New York Times, Chronicle of Higher Education elsewhere. He has authored several books on European politics and was global ed editor at International and Team for five years. His latest book, called Berlin Calling, A Story of Anarchy, Music, War, and the Birth of the Berlin, was published just this year, and he is on a tour through was entered through the United States to present this book. It's a great pleasure to hand the mic and word now to Paul. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for sending those kind words and the invitation to speak as well. Okay, um, yeah, I've got some, um, got a slideshow here of the Berlin Wall taken on. Um, Photographs taken by a Hungarian photographer in the mid to late 1980s. So, a little atmosphere, actually, it was 1985 that I came to, to West Berlin, and this is what it looked like. Uh, the reason I set out to write a book about Berlin um, is not because there aren't already a lot of books about Berlin, because there are, but most of them see Berlin through the lens of the Second World War past, of the rise of Nazis, that Berlin is the center of the Third Reich and through the crimes of, of the Nazi era, including the Holocaust. And I think this is completely legitimate. Um, but it's not the Berlin I wake up in every morning. And I thought that there was another one that um, explains why uh, Berlin is so attractive to me and attractive to so many other people as well. And so I decided to uh, tell the story of Berlin today through its, through its subcultures, um, starting uh, with uh, West Berlin's free low commune, Kamuna Heights, and going all the way to Bergheim. And what I want to do is tell you a little bit about that story now. I'm going to ask uh, in the course of it three questions that maybe we can come around to later. And one of the things that I found in looking at these different movements, going all the way back to the Dadaist movement in the interwar period, was the intensely political nature of Berlin's subcultures. Uh, the Dadaists, of course, were challenging the entire of, you know, Order that, that caused World War I, bringing together art and politics in a completely novel way that, that defined you know, modernism at the time. But skipping, skipping ahead to Kamuna Heights, because that's really where my story begins, uh, this is a part of the student movement who were then a little bit less uh, serious about their street politics like someone, than someone like Rudy Dushka, who was head of the student movement, but rather they set off to redefine. Uh, the German family and, 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 and German living. They felt that uh, uh, the 
rise of Hitler and the Nazis could be only explained through the, the nuclear family and the, the, the relationships that had evolved um, in the family. And they felt that the, that the personal is as political as political parties are marching in the streets. And so they set out to just redefine living, relationships between men and women, mostly it wasn't. Um, and children and adults and parents. It was a radical experiment, very, very political. In the 1970s, it had many, 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 Kuma Einstein eventually broke up under its own contradictions, but it had many, many um, uh, pairs after, um, after it collapsed. In the 1970s in West Berlin, there were all kinds of communist living experiments. And again, all of them intensely political. The squats as well. There were, for example, communes, one called the Hetzel Message, which was just uh, run and lived by like, lesbian women. And uh, there were others uh, that were uh, other houses that were occupied by hardcore anarchists called Autonoma. And they considered their living in these houses poison cops. You know, they were defending the houses and fighting capitalism all at once. Uh, in one of the uh, one of the cultural figures that I talk about in the book a lot is the, the industrial band, the Einstürz and the Neubau, also very political. I mean, they were all about the, the angst of the nuclear age. They were about, you know, here we are in West Berlin at the, at the end of the world. We're facing, we're staring into the, the processes that are going to create the end of the world and dance, dance, the downfall, as a, as a lyric sang. Uh, one thing a lot of people don't know is what this this this, this um, scene in West Berlin was, was was became ultimately quite famous, not least because of the Neubau and their effect on industrial music and many other bands, but also in East Berlin something was happening. In my book, I tell the story about a group called Kirche von Unten, Church from Below, which was a radical group of anarchists um, who played a Role in bringing in bringing down the regime and bringing down the wall, but they were punk rockers. And in Eastern Germany, punk rock was the most in your face, defiant form of opposition that, 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 that there could possibly be. Um, they were immediately zeroed in on by the uh, state security uh, services, and the first generation of punk rockers were were, um, were arrested. One of them, uh, a group called Planos, sang a song called M F. SS and FS is the Ministerium of the Staatssicherheit for the Stasi, and of course the SS were the Nazi stormtroopers. And they said M M F F S S S S S S. They were in prison a month later. Um, and, and of course, uh, in, in East Berlin, the commercialism, and it's not only these bands couldn't even get on the stages of the official venues in uh, Eastern in Eastern Germany. So they had to play on um, the churches because there was a little bit of fry around in the churches and free space that they were allowed to use, or in back courtyards or at parks. Um, and they had to force open any bit of fry around that they had. Now, then when the wall came down, of course, the subcultures of East Berlin and West Berlin met in the ruins of, of the neighborhoods of East Berlin and Prenzlauerberg and Mitte and in Friedrichshain. These were also the squats and the, the occupations of. And in beer factories, and I'm shocked. basically anybody with a crowbar and a good idea could find a place for themselves in, in East Berlin. It was a time that was called by the, by the publisher Christoph Links, he called it Das Wunderbar der Anarchy, the wonderful New York Anarchy. And there were, some of the squats were more uh, radical than others, but the one that I followed in the previous time, they set out to, to help form a new Germany. That's what they wanted to do. And in that, they failed. But I think that they, they influenced, uh, influenced Berlin. Um, and so, throughout the 1990s, actually, so you could say that that's what, that wonderful miracle year of anarchy, you could say it ended with, with unification less than a year after the wall came down. Uh, for me, it ended with the death of my friend Sylvia Meyer, who was a, a, a squatter in one of the Freedom Sign houses. The whole technical crew had started basically in unification. It went throughout the 1990s. But I would question, and my question then is whether, and kind of jumping to today, is whether today's artists and create the creative class is, is really worthy of this legacy. Are they following this intensely political, critical, very often anarchist legacy of their predecessors? 
And let me give one example of what such artist who I think is. And I think some of you probably know this story, but they had um, some years ago, in the middle of the fight there it was a band in Watt, where a number of people, homeless people, but also some artists and tourists had some mixed bag of people uh, set, uh, set up uh, tents, and had an tent city, it was called the Kufre, it was a kind of band in Watt. And uh, you know, the police threatened to raid it a number of times, and finally they did. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, activism around it, and um, demonstrations to protect it, etc. Eventually, it was raided, and um, this this lot is actually you know, at the base of two big old turn of the century Berlin buildings, where the Italian street artist Bloom had painted two new murals. And both of them, that was you know, this thing is a six story six stories high, um, and they they embraced. Hundreds of thousands of postcards, probably. It was, it was almost it was a tourist attraction. You know, tourists came to look first came to Berlin, and one of the things that they would do sometimes is go and look at these murals. Well, uh, Lou so objected to the raiding and the clearing out of the perfect Plaza that he and some of his uh, colleagues, the next day, they took black paint and they painted over the entire murals on both of these buildings. You know, an act which certainly also had to put up. Probably financial consequences for him as well, but it was it was what the Germans call consequent. Um, you know, it was he meant it and he, he he did it. And I just wonder how many. And the question I'm asking, you know, how many Berlin artists today are are still that intensely political? Um, address the story from a slightly different way. Uh, when the wall fell, the city of Berlin and investors and city planners. You know, they all had an idea of what they wanted Berlin to be. They thought it was going to be a, a center of global finance with you know, a skyline like in Manhattan and the population would, would, would balloon from 3.5 million to 5 million. There would be an uh, airport as big as Frankfurt's. We still don't have that. There would hold the Olympics in Berlin in 2000. Well, none of that happened. Uh, the deep pocket the investors who they uh, expected didn't show up. Throughout the 1990s, Berlin lost its population. It was an economic basket case, just as it was during the Cold War. It relied on subsidies, and unemployment shot up to over 20% from basically zero in 1990 to over 20% in 1996. Um, it was during the 90s, though. Thank you for looking forward to this story, and I'm looking forward to, to explore that in the discussion further. We have some questions for you guys. As a next story, I'd like to invite um, Tom Bruno to share, share his information. Do we have uh, another microphone? Is this on? Am I on? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. So, um, before handing the word over to you, Tom, I would love to um, introduce you properly as well. There's two people um, in Los Angeles that are credited with more impact and influence on the cultural revival and search um, in downtown Los Angeles as, as Tom Gilmore is. Tom Gilmore is a downtown, uh, downtown Los LA based developer of residential and commercial properties whose early projects in the city's historic role led to the largest resurgence of real estate investment and development in the, city, the city has experienced in the early half century. Um, his vision for downtown Los Angeles as a thriving, self sustaining urban community led to purchase four abandoned historic buildings in the center of Los Angeles, the Continental, Hellman, San Fernando, Farmers and um, Merchant National Bank, which are now um, grouped together as the old bank, bank district, um, which was the core for the revival, uh, cultural revival of downtown Los Angeles. Apart from Tom's um, commitment to developing uh, real estate in, in Los Angeles, he shows large commitment also to the to the civic development and cultural development in various positions that he fulfills. Amongst others, he's uh, chairman of the Southern California Institute of Architecture, Architecture SciArc. He's the mayor appointee as chairman of Sister Cities of Los Angeles, who have kindly enough uh, been providing funding for this uh, beautiful panel tonight. He's the executive committee member of the Central City Association and. He's um, the founding board member of a, of a thriving, new, and exciting new 
um, the CM in Los Angeles, the main museum focusing on Los Angeles, uh, on Los Angeles artists. With that um, introduction, I would like to hand over my words to you. Thank you. I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing further to say. Uh, but remember, I'm also much older than everybody else, so I've, I've had more time to say. Paul, uh, oh, thank you for your story about uh, Berlin. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating story of mine, and I've fallen in love with Berlin uh, over, the, over the past 10 years, and I've been there quite a lot, and, and have a, a, a really strong relationship through since I've seen it for the 50 years now. Um, and, and, and when you speak about it, I, I, you know, there's, a, it, you know, there's such a drama to the, to the trajectory of Berlin. I mean, it, it, it's mixed in this incredible hurricane of, of social and political events. Um, and so I was trying to try to come up with, with what, what, why, why is Berlin and, and why, why are we related? Why is Berlin and Los Angeles uh, an, an interesting and reasonable mixture? What makes what makes the current relationship between Los Angeles and Berlin meaningful, uh, and, and how those histories interact. And then I thought, well, that LA is a much more benign environment than Berlin. It doesn't have this this struggle, not just of East and West, but of, 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 of politics and commerce and art. And, and, and you know, how is LA compared to that? Um, and then it occurred to me that it, that it actually does. And strangely enough, the timeline is very, very close in terms of when LA becomes ascendant in the late 90s and, and early 2000s. LA goes through a terrible period in the early 90s uh, where we have earthquakes, we have riots, we, you know, the, the, you know, the hills are on fire. It really becomes this, this sort of apocalyptic vision of urban America. And, and the struggle in Los Angeles um, was one that in many ways was very subtle uh, but, but every bit as much insidious as, as the struggles that were occurring in, in, uh, in Berlin, and that was these notions of, of what constitutes a city. LA had been sort of the great city of the, of the 40s and 50s in America, and, and had you know, based its entire future on the automobile, essentially. It, it, it essentially dis disassembled itself in the 50s and 60s to accommodate the automobile. And so, in, in the process of doing that, it reconfigured the notion of the urban environment, and to a large extent, any notion of the arts or humanity or, or, or any uh, interaction between small local groups of creative, creative people were driven into the suburbs. So that the, the suburb versus the city became an incredible dialectic uh, 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 that was going on on a regular basis in Los Angeles. So when I came along uh, in the uh, early 90s, uh, I was very confused with it as a city. I had come from New York and, and uh, wasn't exactly sure how to deal with the city and, and really couldn't find the artistic center or the creative center of the city. It was so dispersed um, that, that I found it disconcerting because I, I believe that the interaction of people in, in dense environments uh, leads to, to great things. Uh, and, and LA is not living up to its potential as this sort of gateway city to the, to the west from the east and, and as the center of, of current uh, culture in America uh, through the, the, the lens of Hollywood. Um, so when I came to Los Angeles, I was confronted with a relatively dead downtown. I mean a very dead downtown uh, in the sense that when I bought these buildings, uh, which was basically a square block in, in downtown Los Angeles, Every single one of those buildings was empty, and the next hundred buildings around them were empty. It was like a giant urban black hole um, in the middle of downtown, which was confounding to me. I, didn't, I couldn't understand it again as a New Yorker. I thought that the architectural infrastructure was so dramatic and so important um, that clearly there, had to, there was this idea that had not taken hold in the city of Los Angeles, and it turned out to be this residual notion of the suburban city, the multipolar, fractured, Metropolis, which is what constituted LA. Um, and so my inclination and ultimately the action that I took was to begin to, and, and this is not, and I know I'm, I'm sorry, I look like a secret service person right now, but I'm just a guard man. Uh, so I actually am a real human being. Uh, so I came into LA and I literally uh, had no more than $100 at the time. Uh, not somebody who was doing well financially. I was a, a 
guess it's the architect coming to LA from New York because there was no work for me in New York. Um, but these buildings um, were so awful, were, were so close to the precipice of falling into, the, into you know, complete and utter um, uh, disrepair that I was able to put them into what we call escrow uh, and, and buy them for almost nothing at the time because they were a liability to everybody who owned them. Anybody who owned them was at risk of being sued because God forbid you wouldn't sue them in America or in the state of California. But I was able to put these into contract for very, very little money and I spent a year trying to get money to, to finally develop them and, and, and I did. Um, and then I had to inhabit them because I realized that at a certain point, what was driving in the city of Los Angeles was almost entirely commerce-based. There was, there was no um, residential population, no creative population in downtown Los Angeles, other than where we are right now in the arts district, which was a real island. I mean, a, a genuine island. It was the first place that I, that I came to to see what was going on in the creative community. And it was a little so isolated that I didn't think it was going to have the sort of broad impact that it was going to have. So, I ended up um, developing these buildings. Uh, I had come from architecture and a fine arts background, um, so I was, I was engaged with the creative community, and then everything started to go well, and we started to make money, and, and you know, and then all of a sudden we became you know, sort of real estate moguls, and everything was just dandy and wonderful, except the, the what was occurring in, in Berlin was beginning to occur in Los Angeles, and that was that it, it's this mixed blessing. And the mixed blessing was, yes, we were making money, yes, this, the, the city was expanding at a, at a very rapid rate and really uh, becoming a, a dynamic force uh, in the country and I think globally, but the very source of, of that dynamism, the very the heart of that dynamism, which was the creative community, the artistic community, was being driven out relatively quickly. And it didn't take long before the prices, even in my own projects, began to rise so quickly that we were in danger of losing the very thing that made us uniquely Los Angeles, uniquely a creative urban environment, and, and something that was appealing to the, to, to the country at large and to the city as, as an entity. So we got involved. Do I have something to click? Oh, this is it. Oh, yeah. So, um, we made a decision early on. My partner, Jerry Brown, was a, a fabulous woman who, who has been with me and, and her husband uh, with us both uh, for a number of years, realized at a certain point that we had been dedicated to the local artistic community. We had all of our galleries. We were giving away gallery space. We were doing everything we could to support the local artistic community. But now, the, the, the world of economics was beginning to really show its ugly head, and we were going to have to do something pretty dramatic um, to, to essentially uh, mitigate the, the, the problems that were occurring because of the, the economic dynamics that were going on in the building industry. So what we decided to do was, instead of support a little gallery here and a little gallery there, what we decided to do was figure out a way to support the artistic community and effectively embed in perpetuity um, cultural component into our project and as, as you would a virus. So that what we would do is give up at the time 60,000 square feet, what's that in meters? <laughs> uh, <laughs> 6,000 6, 6, square, 6, so, so 6, square meters within our buildings and in the storefront and created what we call the main museum. Now the main museum is not a museum per se, it's a it's, a, it's, a, it's not It's not a collecting museum, it is, it is a museum designed for the support of local artists, Los Angeles artists in, in particular. And so we began this process with a thing called Beta Main, which was the, the first section of this, and we are continuing to build it right now. But the point that we were trying to accomplish, and that I think we are accomplishing, is that without intervention, without, without capitalists like me deciding that capitalism has limits, that capitalism, you can only get so rich, you can only accumulate so much stuff, you can only drive so good a car, that at a certain point, it's really important for developers, capitalists, business people of Wall Street to reinvest, not just in the community at large, but within, with the creative community, and to create a community within these projects that we do as developers permanently. 
so that so that the coming and going of economics doesn't move artists out of an area so that the people who have created these beautiful areas that we know and love now are are preserved and and and, and ultimately supported by us in, in something like the museum. So we've been doing a lot of work. Um, we are still very much midstream, but we're incredibly dedicated to doing it because we realize that the future of the city of Los Angeles, and I have a great love of the city, is based on this local artistic community, on this local Los Angeles artistic community. Um, but in that context, using our geography, using our, our local community to reach out to the broader community globally. And so when we saw Berlin, Berlin became one of the most attractive places for us to interact with because Berlin sat in that same funny place where everything was at risk, but everything was possible. And I think it's really up to people like us here at this table, certainly our own mayor's office is, is engaged in this process. But it's important that this discussion happens because the future of how cities engage with the arts is, is, is a, paramount, a, a, a paramount concern to us. And without it, commerce defeats content. Commerce defeats culture. So unless you embed culture and content into these projects, you end up with, with an untenable situation and, and, and we need to preserve that culture. So that's, our, that's what we're trying to do now. And hopefully that's what we'll do for the next 20 years. And preserve that Thank you very much, Tom, for this fascinating story. Um, as an expedition, building kind of on very much on what, what Tom just said, and this is that now we're in a situation where everything is, is at risk and everything is possible. One of the most impactful stories that Berlin has to tell, in that perspective, and one of the most interesting contributions is the story of Volkswagen and the very different communities um, associated to it. We have the great pleasure to host two people standing as, as leading figures for the development of, of Volkswagen in our panel tonight. So uh, this afternoon, which is uh, I'm in Bangkok, I'm in to introduce you a little bit more in detail before you go into your story. My um, mostly Anya, who uh, then was born in, in Russia. She has uh, finished her law studies in moved to Berlin in 2006, where she got engaged with the uh, alternative and legendary community around Bar 25. She's the co founder of the Hotspot Project and has been engaged as the chairman of the Cooperative for Urban Creativity, the Nossenschaft für Urbane Kreativität which involves investors and philanthropists to enable the development and construction of the Holzmann village in the This is um, I'm going to share with us just in a second. She's the co-initiator of the European Network for of City Makers, um, a platform to represent and support creative urban projects and sustainable and useful city spaces in Berlin. And since 2014, Anja has been also a member of the jury for the promotion of independent performing artists in the Berlin Senate. And a great pleasure having you. And um, <laughs> the conversations with Anya and me that um, in, in summer this year has actually led to the development and the gear of this panel, so we're grateful that you can make it. Um, next to Anya Mario Hustmeyer is the, chair, uh, is the chairman of the Holzmann Cooperative, which focuses on sustainable local urban development. After earning his degree at the University of Economics in East Berlin, Mario was active in the student movement following the fall of the war. He began his career as a journalist, which led him to join um, the European publishing house Uma in 1996. This was, at this position, Mario spent 10 years abroad, establishing leading print publications in Slovakia, Hungary, Austria, and Serbia. Back in Hamburg, at the Uma headquarters, Mario was in charge of promoting the internationalization of, his, um, of magazines such as Geo. After leaving Bruna in 2006, Mario advised international media businesses and supported startups in the Atlantic area. He then returned to Berlin in 2010, where he founded the Cooperative Founders Network and the Schaffen before assuming his current position at the Hotspot. It's a great pleasure to have you here, and I'm very much honored to be presented. Thank 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, I can refer to uh, someone who grew up actually in this room. I don't think that it was a blessing. It was good luck. And I never thought that I would say that uh, it might have been it was good luck. But actually, the subculture uh, couldn't uh, the subculture in Berlin couldn't have developed without the free space that they all, after fall, left in the middle of the city. Uh, but Berlin was poor, it was as well good luck because nobody had money who was able to rebuild Berlin. As it is, you see, what we are talking about is the very center of Berlin. And what you see here, these are the left abandoned spots in the very, very center of Berlin. There are factories abandoned for more than 40 years. And uh, what you see right now, these are the development projects of Berlin in the very center. Um, just to go quickly through, these are the spots of subculture. Uh, this is uh, a new period in Berlin that all the, um, all the movement, the spots of culture, and that's why I like what, uh, what Tom just said, culture is not just uh, an appendix of city development, this is the heart of uh, city development. And all these spots are now threatening uh, to, to get great edge. Um, what we did is, this was a very uh, prominent subcultural spot, a club called Kikitofa. This is what they built after. This was the factory, Karte Holzig. This is how it looks now. So this is how the city changed and how culture got, uh, you know, kicked off the very center of the city. What we did is, at Holzmann, there was a menu. Um, and this is back to, to the roots, the bar 25. You're going to see tomorrow, now it's Saturday, the story of bar 25. I'm going to show the movie of this place. This was an about sorry. This was an abandoned spot. Uh, just some people jump over the fence and open the bar. Not thinking of city development or investments, they just said that's not a good time. What they did is they actually built every single year for eight weeks, but they needed to have a good time with friends. That this became a movement when 300,000 people came to this spot during summer just to enjoy theater, clubbing, um, kinder, kindergarten. Stuff like this, so we made out of the desert a lively place. Unfortunately, the city had plans, as we already heard. They wanted to build office buildings over there, and this was the time, and maybe Paul can confirm, where the uh, autonomic movement, so the real radical movement, merged with the cannabis movement. They made a protest. Uh, this uh, protest was about that the riverbank or the riverside should be open for the public. This was not self-evident in Berlin. Uh, so actually we were successful with the referendum about this, but this referendum was not binding. So the city decided to kick us off the, off the land and we just moved across the river to this ballot factory. And uh, interesting enough, uh, um, Tom just asked what is the relation to, to cities like Los Angeles and cities like Detroit. So the, this is some of the sources of the German culture. So it's very famous artists and uh, authors moved to Los Angeles during the war. This was the exile place for people and it's still one of the most popular Actors from I know from my childhood from from Germany. He moves to Pacific Palisades, and he said that he didn't want to meet his best friend again, who uh, was a traitor to the MF SS. So um, uh, that's um, uh, the soundtrack of the reunification of Berlin, which you said came from the US. This was techno music. So this became a peaceful, a very peaceful movement of reunification 
But what we did is we actually knew that this factory, no window, no water supply, no heating, within three months, um, just for one and a half, and finally two years, we built the cultural place there. First time, um, all over the year, 365 days, we had a restaurant, we had theaters, we had clubs, we had music studios, but we knew we have to get off this building because they were toxic. They put out to build the luxury apartments. Finally, uh, the city decided to sell the land because the city has no capacity and competence to, to make our plan. So they decided to sell the land where the ball 25 was located to a private investor. And we decided to participate in this tender and to make an offer to the city to build there an urban creative place, an urban creative village. Uh, we just decided that from the bird perspective, because we built the Bar 25 at the Kato Holzig with all the ingredients uh, the city needs. You cannot get at this place good coffee, fresh vegetables, no bread, because there's just the main station and there you can get the coffee at Starbucks or at the whatever at the kiosk. So what we did is this we just uh, convinced the pension fund to buy the land and to give the land to us as a leasehold that we paid from the very very first moment the rent, the interest for the land. So we moved from subcultural activist to actually yeah, kind of use the capitalist instruments to protect and preserve a, a, a black spot. And how we paid the rent? We played music, we sold beer, and we had a very good restaurant. And just didn't calculate in terms of square meters or square feet you could build there potentially, but what does it take to have a lively neighborhood? And what you see there, it's a theater, it's a marketplace, and this is how we earned the money to develop this village. What you see there, it's an arch of the main railway track, and after four months, it was a restaurant for three years. So this was our, our plan some years ago, actually five years ago, and this is what you see there. This was the first uh, um, paintings we had from this place, and this is how it was done after five years. We made it and we were surprised by ourselves that it looks quite similar. Some impressions, this was the riverside, this is how it looks now. This is the public market, this is the residence for artists and musicians. This is the kindergarten, very important, this was the first new building we opened. And all the facades are, um, are created by artists and residents from our place. This is our restaurant. This restaurant is underground because we had, we had to dedicate or we wanted to dedicate the whole marketplace to the public. So it's, everything is public there and the rooftop is a terrace for the sunset. And further, the restaurant. No, no, we, we created our own event venue for theater, for art performances. Um, this is uh, very interesting. This is something where you can have uh, subculture and high culture together at one spot. And this is our family. And this is something we have to tell our mayor that it's not just about city development, but all the cities living in, the, in, in Berlin, they want to work. And we have more than 300 people working in our place and earning their Daily life. So this was the closing party, the, the picture above, this was the closing party of the Bar 25. And the picture below was the opening party of our new of our new village. Um, unfortunately we had to, to close the road. So many people came there uh, and blocked the street and the mayor complained. He said, listen, it's your fault because the you need more such places in Berlin that uh, not 8,000 people run up 
to to places like this. And uh, I I just I think I finished the first uh, words to give a uh, chance to there to say something because we uh, can make it to the point that subculture Tom can do more than just follow development. They can uh, initiate further developments, I think. Continuing on, on the story of exploring um, novel for, forms of creative impact from, from subculture and, and creative experimentation, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Eric Espinosa. Eric um, is a person that has a, um, a very colorful background, and very different um, many hats on. If you want to say, I'm going to ask you how to introduce, uh, how I may be able to introduce you. Um, not a, a one clear um, answer emerged, so I have to try it with, with different directions. Eric is a, a theatrical executive producer for ZX here in Los Angeles, the CEO of the Creative Horizon Foundation, and more recently, he ventured into a very close relationship with the mayor's office in Los Angeles as a special, a special projects advisor for the um, LA Mayor's Operations Innovation Team. Um, and projects that he's been focusing on in that capacity um, is a very exciting project of the mayor's top challenge, and I think this will, will, will touch on um, briefly in the presentation, as well as the very recent founding of a, of a very exciting new initiative called the City Collapse, where um, the official, official funding party, as I, as I um, heard, was just taking place as yesterday, so it's brand new of the president. Um, I'm really glad to, uh, to have you here today, so, so thank you. Thank you both. So, um, thank you, by the way, for having me here. The, I want to start with kind of going off of. Um, I've been a part of the mayor's office for the last two years, and it's been a very unorthodox way of my being in there. I, this is how I actually would work. Everyone else looks like Tom. Um, <laughs> uh, and when I was actually coached, because prior to the mayor's office, I was working on a platform for how we move food place from point A to point B so that we could be serving underserved communities. And my background is also in brand and marketing, and, a lot more in the creative field, and then I got brought, brought into the, the mayor's office. And they, there's a big joke that happens is that Eric doesn't have an angel and devil on his shoulders, he has an idea fairy. And that idea fairy just never shuts up. And um, it, because of that, almost gave me a, a big pain in the ass because here is almost this creative that is now sitting amongst all these policy makers. And the, it's been really interesting because when you're in that kind of Format, I like to say I'm the ivory tower of democracy is a lot of people don't understand a lot of what you're up to. And so kind of using ideas as my North Star, believing that you know really that ideas are quite literally the future for all of us. And but when looking at the context of what government and how it plays is the government government touches all of our lives and we've sent people to the moon based off of ideas. But we have horrible traffic here in Los Angeles. And even with those ideas, we can't really do much with them. Um, and with looking at the way that Los Angeles is, we're the creative capital of the world. And that's what my boss, Eric Garcetti, likes to say. Um, was even mentioning is that we're the creative capital. But if we have all these ideas and they're not really kind of doing much, do they really mean anything? And so it's kind of my, my hope and dreams of, of engaging the creative community and looking at this as a city of imagination. Of like, if once we start embedding those ideas into the imagination and actually putting them forward, what is the impact that can be created? And so, because this is where I work at uh, LA City Hall, we've been looking at what initiative I, I was running prior. If anyone is familiar with X Price Foundation, um, I was running the, the Mayor's Cup, which was very much what I like to call X Prize in City, City Hall. It's a civic prize innovation competition where it's how do you incentivize the public to come up with solutions to our civic challenges and we'll give a $25,000 grant, we'll incubate them here in the city. And we 
did a really good job, was considered a huge success to the administration because of the end result, we actually developed a traveling resource center for small businesses in underserved communities that was also bilingual. And the cool part about that was it's literally going through South LA and we have, we have nine brick and mortar locations here in Los Angeles, but they're in the more affluent areas, so this is actually going out there. And seeing how that we could utilize city resources to actually fast track progress because uh, as my boss likes to say here too, is here in Los Angeles, we don't worry about the most powerful man in the country. We empower the most powerful, um, most vulnerable people in our own backyard. And looking at how we examine that, and I think the only downside to what has been happening on the national level is we have really great ideas at City Hall and many of the ideas that are really innovative, but people are losing the bandwidth to, to execute. And that is really, really unfortunate because with that traveling resource center, it was something that started at City Hall and then had to be shelved because um, we, the current administration was voted in um, in Washington. And that was just really unfortunate. We've seen that happen on a daily basis. And so that has created an opportunity to, because of seeing the mayor's up, let's see what the national dialogue is. And knowing that we're Los Angeles, we have actually a very popular administration here with uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti. How do we start leveraging that to create the impact that we want to see in the, this community? And so now we, we've re reversed this and started the, this new initiative, Civic Collapse, where it's a civic incubator that's in, that is empowering entrepreneurs, technologists, organizations that want to create an impact, connecting them to policymakers, that we could actually fast track and co develop solutions that affect civic change. So if we want to look into the world of food waste, we can actually fast track that. If we want to look in how we help solve, um, solve homelessness, we fast track that as well. But, but the main emphasis is protecting the IP for the, the private industry so that it's their idea still, but we're using the LA um, city as a resource and unlocking potential and how we do that. And so it's my hope that we actually, with my boss again saying, this is the greater capital of the world that we're also going to still in each. I'm kind of cheering on saying, no, let's become a prototype city of the world. So that we could build a prototype here, do it in LA, scale it, and then actually create the network and share it anywhere else in the country or even the world. So it's my hope that we have come up with a solution for food waste. We, we can really demonstrate and make it work here, but we can take it to Brooklyn. We can take it to Austin. We can take it to Minneapolis and many other places. And we've been really moving forward with this idea of building a prototype city, which made me laugh because I discovered uh, through my partner in crime, it's not an original idea. It all started with Disney. <laughs> so I don't know if many of you know this is Epcot and what Epcot actually stands for. It's the Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. And it was Walt Disney's vision of how do you start to unlock the potential of a city to showcase the world leading changes that can be co developed and using creativity as that basis. It was one of my, our favorite pictures because here's him actually um, demonstrating what that's supposed to be. And the irony was, and this is literally right after the fact that we were kind of, they're going to make prototype city, prototype city. Um, then we discovered this. We, we then also discovered that Walt actually founded Epcot by using LA as a template to what he wanted to build in Florida. And it's like, you know, it's our hope is that we're, we're fast tracking a lot of this innovation and being able to lead this, I would say, a beacon of hope that, again, my boss, oops, I'm sorry, is a, a quote that has been very inspiring to us as we've been building up this program. And I'd like to be almost kind of out on this, because it's, it falls in line to what we are trying to build here in Los Angeles as well, and being this very eclectic group of coalitions, because what the main goal is realizing if we want to be able to create this, we have to be actually collaborating with many other groups. So Civic Labs main focus is how do we democratize the world of impact within Los Angeles, but also use that as a template that we can ship around anywhere else. But working with larger brands, as we last night, um, Christian just mentioned, we did a launch event with Vice, with the group working, not working, we work with Google, Tinder, Snapchat, uh, Techstar, XPRIZE is another one of our that we've been working with, and we have actually been very fortunate to be in the, um, the midst of actually collaborating with Epcot itself and really showcasing anything that we do here, 
we can spread around. And it's this idea that Los Angeles today is a vision of what America is reaching for tomorrow. And and really using that as a North Star, just knowing that we are a bastion of, of creativity, of democracy, and this is something that we've always been yearning for and we're not seeing on that national level. But the other thing that has been incredibly humbling to us is just knowing that, that too many people feel paralyzed in our cities. And by this model that we're trying to create is fast-tracking so that we don't have to be paralyzed anymore. And that we just can't be passive when it comes to our aspirations and developing um, ideas and waiting for the government to actually implement them. Because, yeah, we have really brilliant individuals, and I'm someone that is from the mayor's office, and it's interesting to know is that we have about 110 people in the mayor's office, we have 4 million citizens. So if you start to think about those numbers, how can so much be done, especially in a term that's four years, or if there's special elections two years, or five years, or six years, it's not a lot of time really in that perspective. So we can't be just waiting for these things to be built on a case-by-case basis. We need to start engaging the community and so, so we can help co-develop the Los Angeles that we want to see in the future, to build a blueprint that reflects our collective future as well that we could be shipping from Los Angeles to anywhere else in the world. And I, I really geek out on this idea because it's something that started with my own personal story. I was homeless at one point, and actually three weeks ago was the eighth anniversary of me being homeless, and I was at, it was actually a couple blocks away at in San Pedro. And having gone through that experience, but not only was I homeless, right after me getting out of being homeless, I got I caught a spine flu and had sepsis, they had a head on car collision, and then my own mother being diagnosed with stage four cancer. This all happened within 11 months. And seeing that kind of perspective, and seeing city services from an interesting perspective, is then kind of formed this idea of seeing all the silos that exist within impact, and that's really unfortunate to all these groups that want to work on homelessness, to all these groups that want to work in health and wellness. And the government is since it touches all of our lives, it has that responsibility to actually help aggregate, and it hasn't been doing that job well enough. And that's been our hope in trying to actually aggregate all these city services so that we can have everyone be a part of the solution. So that Civico Labs, with its success, it's not about Eric Garcetti, it's not about the city of Los Angeles, it's not about me, it's about all of us working together to solve these civic challenges. Because if we do that, we'll save lives. And that's ultimately our goal, if we can do that, here, it's our goal that we can just do it anywhere. And with my, I just love this one quote is to know that one life has been easier because you've existed, that's so succeeded. And if we start to empower all those individuals to act that way, anything easy. Thank you very much, Eric, for this uh, fascinating story. Um, with that, with your contribution, we close the, um, the story section and the presentation. We would like to go into the discussion. There's been several topics that have emerged um, during the presentations that are, that are um, worthwhile taking, taking up on. Um, I see one central element that was present in all of your, your stories that uh, the notion of this very local um, contribution that you're doing, like, um, focusing on on a, like on an activism in, 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 in a protected region and in an urban environment and creating local impact that may or may not be also scalable to other places. This is something that um, that Eric, you've been you've been passionate or are passionate about very much, and um, that is also something that I um, that I know that, that Anna and Maru have been um, also closely um, in touch with us, you've been traveling the world now pretty uh, much telling the story of Volkswagen and being able to see through your various networks how other cities and places deal with the very same challenge trying to create impact from the structures. So my first question would go in that direction and I would like to um, ask this to Anna and Mario. How do you see 
from from your very own personal perspective the the ability of of scaling up um, local impact and local structures that um, that that were created in the middle of the world's market. How do you see the difference on the basis and how do you see an exchange with those angels, for example, um, possible as a as a I think it's, uh, it's very ambitious to create a blueprint for creativity. And uh, what we are doing is just, uh, we are a community of open source. We take it from the IT industry because we have a lot of founders in our network. They say that uh, if you have an idea and you share it, you can benefit more than to create a, a proprietary system to scale it. And what we are doing in the cities like Detroit, Tel Aviv, Tessalonique, Belgrade, is uh, encourage and enable where, in the best case, inspire people to just do it. To start a place, to, to build up a community, and this is what happened in all these cities. They are inspired, as they tell us, from, from the story of Berlin from places and it was not the city who invented this. This was not a master plan. This was the people and that Berlin was attractive in the in the seventies and in the eighties for the creators of the investment community. Because it was it was isolated, it was a free place for David Bowie, Bob uh, and, and Nick Cave and they moved there because of the atmosphere. Uh, I don't know how many people a very small percentage of the, of the activists in Berlin are from Berlin. They moved to Berlin because of the atmosphere they created. Um, and this is an open, it's a very open minded uh, atmosphere there. This as it was in Los Angeles for for the for the intellectual elite who exiled to, to Los Angeles because of this atmosphere. Um, so we don't export, we try to inspire, we try to support. So what we learn, we share. And uh, that's why we are um, happy to inspire other people, nothing else. Perhaps. Yeah, um, it is what Miles said, exactly. But at the same time, uh, what I experience as well is um, on one hand, uh, Communities and initiatives and artists and people were meeting abroad and in different cities. We all talk about uh, same problems, and we all talk about uh, the same intention and same motivation about being uh, active participants of the development of the process of creating the environment. And this is what I think very important. Not just like to give people spaces and to tell them, okay, you have few years to do something there. Yeah? But to integrate them into the dialogue on the A level to give a chance. And on the other hand, I see uh, from the side of uh, authorities of different cities from Amsterdam, from Melbourne, from Tel Aviv, they come to us and they ask um, how would it be uh, possible to integrate communities and create people on an effective way? So, which means to include economical perspective on it. And what I think is very important to understand in this process is that it's not enough to give uh, just space or to give money to creative people to infuse them with, with uh, um, resources, but to take them seriously and to give them time. Because a uh, creative economy doesn't work with a normal economy, like classical economy, um, maximum profit in the shortest time, creative people or people with creative and social approach, they need time. And this is what uh, enabled Holzman. This is why people uh, tell us, oh, this is a model, but what kind of model? We can tell that Holzman might be an example. What, uh, what might happen when entrepreneurs with interesting ideas uh, match with investors with social approach uh, with ability to work on the long term? So this is, I think, is very important, and we see that there is this yearning on um, more uh, fluent, more human, more social development. But I think the system, the uh, political system, first also needs to um, not to adapt but to open it. 
itself to to show its creativity and so this is what Yohan is in the audience always says we had a creative project is creative program so creativity is not only the class but it's a need of all of us. So I, I personally don't expect anything from the municipality of the city. If the mayor would ask me, what do you expect from us? Get out of the way. Don't interfere with creativity because the city, the, the, the task of the city, or the objective of the city, the mayor should be to enable people and to, to, to provide the framework for whatever creativity, productivity, for, for entrepreneurship. And that's really, we are not disappointed. We just didn't expect anything. But we just we just did it. And we are surprised with the result, to be honest. I would like to play back that um, that input um, to, to Tom and Eric as they're both in various positions, both heavily and uniquely also with the administration, with the mayor's office, and you are trying to create in your own ways to tackle issues that, that very heavily rely on actually a, a fruitful collaboration and synergy with the um, with, with the administration. So um, we'd love to hear your take on on the involvement of the administration. Well, I think you, you, you I think you've really hit the nail on the head. I think that the key word that, that you were using is enable. Um, I am also very suspect of, of government intervention beyond a certain point. Um, uh, I also recognize that that, that government is the, is by definition the governing authority that lets things happen or doesn't let things happen. They can shut you down. They can help you open up. Um, I think when government gets into the creative, the business of creativity, they're they're on very dangerous ground. They're they're in a place where that that, that is not natural for them. Um, they may have natural advocates within the system, but but government in and of itself is not is not a creative environment as far as, far as I'm concerned. What they do have the capacity to do is to do exactly what you're saying. They, they have the capacity to back off. Um, I brought it down to a different level in development, where when we do a development that we're we're working on, it is it, it, there's always an assumption that somehow a developer has to figure out every single thing that's going to happen on every square foot of every project they're they're working on, and we we refuse to work like that. What we try to put in, excuse me, is a framework, and with enormous unanswered questions within that framework, and. The, and create effectively a template, as you would in a petri dish. You, you, you set up a you, you set up an environment, and then cut everybody loose, and and watch what happens, and then respond to what happens. That's really all you can do as a creative developer. You can't. If I envision everything from A to Z, that's the most restrictive, most unartistic environment I can possibly imagine to work within. But if I can put together a template. That enables creative behavior to happen without without my input. I think it's really important that my input is not there. In fact, in our little museum, I'm not allowed to talk about what might or might not happen there. I have no veto power. I have no input other than support, because for me to touch it is for me to ruin the experiment. Is you know the worst thing you can do to a petri dish is touch the petri dish, because if you do, you you destroy the experiment and ultimately. This is an experimental process, and so those people who have the capacity to enable need to remain in that condition. It's strictly in the enabling condition, so that people can create and create within that open environment. It's, it's kind of essential, and yet not many people in my business um, or in government are willing to do it. <laughs> oh, it's. Uh... It's funny, it's like what we've been doing here in the city of LA and, and, and these public private partnerships and engaging different groups. And um, what was, I'll, I'll kind of backtrack. When I joined, it took about eight months to get my, my feet just in City Hall, um, getting used to the, the whole dynamics. And the team I was on, we, we did amazing work and you never heard about it. Which is kind of a very interesting, and it's. I always believe that government is the largest social impact organization, as it should be, 
And but it's they're not storytellers. They don't know how to tell stories or anything like that. So for instance, my team members, what we executed on was the ability we reworked the procurement system so that now minorities and women owned businesses have access to seven hundred thousand um, contracts for about eight billion dollars. But no one heard about it because they didn't know how to package it. And with this partnership that we've been looking at in kind of now, or at least how I've been aiming to do stuff is kind of saying to these different brands that we're engaging, lots of brands, and I mean it's like Ford and Audi and Tide and um, Disney and XPRIZE, they they all want to tell stories and they all want to create impact, they just don't know how. And then that's where I've been in this in City Hall, I was like, oh, we know what problems exist. How do we actually start to move forward and and merge the two. And so it's almost, I've actually been coming up with creative briefs <laughs> for groups like Tide. To, so to give you an example, uh, so Tide you knows, you know, you know, they create detergents and we're several blocks away from Skid Row and um, there's lots of people that need to get their clothes washed. It's a public health issue, it's massive. And in fact, the city is actually worried that a pandemic is gonna come out from Skid Row. Um, we also have the census. The census is one of the most important things that's for our democracy, and we have a census team that is embedded within City Hall, and the, we have the largest part of town community in the country, meaning that the, when the census happens, we don't know how many people are actually around here because it's just a large county. That includes homeless, that includes undocumented individuals, and so we created a, with this partnership, where we've been actively in conversations with Tide, and how do we get the, them to subsidize washers and dryers, and then we're looking at different platforms of actually getting um, rings with NFC technology so that a homeless person wouldn't have to fill out the census. They would then receive a ring that has an NFC that would then unlock the possibility for them to have access to washers and dryers for several months. And by that, we're saying, tight, this falls within your mission. This is then also your ability to be a storyteller and how you're solving one of our largest civic issues that is not just Los Angeles as well and how it kind of go in. And so we've been a little bit more proactive in the in having our hands in the creativity, but ultimately saying this is your story to also tell, and we get to be little well, the enablers of this. And that's been really, really exciting to be able to bridge a lot of these gaps because it's now seeing that um, that if we create those silos of just saying that creativity is separate from government. And if we want to be that creative capital of the world, it's not going to do us any good as, as the city of Los Angeles, the city of angels. We have to start looking at how we create these hybrids to actually work together, work forward. Even like last night, where we actually did a campaign with Vice Media on how do we move food waste from point A to point B and coming up with creative briefs and, and getting things out there. So it's been a really kind of flipping the idea of how government acts and also participates in that public private partnership. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'd like to just chime in on this because I have a slightly different take than, than other people on the panel. I mean, I agree completely with you that it's got to be grassroots and nothing. You know, one part of the Berlin ethic is do it yourself. It has been since its Comuna Heights. And indeed, you know, uh, local government throwing a few crumbs to, to artists isn't going to do it either. But we do live in democracies and we do have an effect on the parties in power and legislation. And I think that there are three things is that can institutionalize. Uh, the situations, the conditions in Berlin that have given us the fried round, and exactly as Annie said, the fried side three times as well. These have been the conditions for the incredible creativity in Berlin over the decades. The first that has to happen is there have to be meaningful rent controls that keep rent affordable for people of low income, for artists who are not commercially successful. We've already heard, we know what's happening with the galloping gentrification in Berlin, and there is a way to stop it. It's not a natural phenomenon like a hurricane or something. It's a social, political, economic way to be stopped with meaningful rent controls. The second thing is studio space has to also have its own special rent control. At the moment, this isn't the case. Studio space is the same as any commercial space. And what can happen? It's happened in my little office uh, this year. Uh, the rent was jacked up by 50% and there was nothing I could do about it. So studio space has to be protected in another way. And then something has to be maintained. The Germans have a wonderful institution that Americans don't know about. It's got a big long name called the Kutzer Sozialkasse. The 
the artist social fund could be translated like that. And in the Forbes, artists, many different kinds, they get a page of you, 50 different kinds of um, artists that they consider um, qualified for the program. And according to your income, basically, you get health insurance, which is half paid then by the state. You make contributions to the equivalent of Social Security, which is then also matched by the state. And it's got some other benefits as well. But I couldn't write books like this or any of the other ones that I did, and I, this is really the case with almost all of the creative types I know, were not for, for, this, um, for this institution. Um, considering that we only have a few minutes left, I would um, like to perhaps sum up a few of the key thoughts that we had today and, and then perhaps bring in one last idea that we that is very good to me to discuss as well. I guess what we all talked about and what every um, single contribution and story was centering around was this kind of very thin line that's working between kind of creative freedom and the capacity to create impact, which at, at, this, at some degrees, um, like not going very, very easily had a hand with each other because of creativity needs experimentation, needs different spaces, but in order to be completely free, um, you are kind of shielded off the very same structures that enable you to create an art um, on a larger scale. Just it up. And, um, so Tom, you suggest that that um, you want the, the artists and the culture to be like happily and uniquely like, ingrained and uh, embedded into the very structures that you're creating. Eric, you, you see you see partnerships with uh, with corporates and with the local administration in order to, to kind of develop ideas and then, then scale them up um, and even give creativity briefs to, to the branch that I find fascinating. One, one last story that I would, uh, would like to hear input from is, is the one of, of um, a very exciting story of Ecker that you're, um, that you're about to, to create. So Mario, in the context of uh, of Holzmarkt. and this is for me uh, a story that kind of symbolizes the very like end development of work, not end development, but a very important milestone towards impact creation from a free experimental meditation um, structure. So, with that, um, that thought, I would um, like to tell your story about that. It's, uh, it's a reference to uh, to Paul actually. How to preserve space, free space, and free time for people. Um, so we, um, which, and it's just the approach. Nobody of uh, our team is an architect or a developer or something like that. So we are a group of people which just answer questions. How do we get this land bought by the city, owned by the city cleaning company? They divided it for further development into two parts. So there's only one criteria for city official. They don't want to get trouble selling this land. So we took all of the land. And there was one small part of the land that we can now reflect on the main street of Berlin. We had no idea what to do with this land. We were approached by developers. They said, just build an incubator. You can make a lot of money. You can earn, ah, okay, incubator. What are you willing to contribute to the Hotsman? We asked the developer. Let's just take the land. So, okay. Then we were approached by another developer, and he said, you have to build a student's apartment. Because student's apartment is a very, very good business. Because you calculate per capita and not per square meter. So you, you get more out of a student apartment than for the most expensive office building. What, what did we do? We didn't sell. We just asked the question, what is the challenge for a student coming to Berlin? He can move to a student's hostel. Uh, they are in Schlachtensee, Adlershof, and somewhere else. It's in the middle of nowhere in the suburbs. Or he can share with four students an apartment, and this is gentrification because four students together can afford more than the family. So, one of the major districts of Berlin are entered by students. 
Mommy said, what is the problem with all these Chinese coming to Berlin? And what about the... the today's discussion here was all about how to bring startups to LA or to Berlin. And we said, all of these successful businesses were founded by people who never finished the risk. Mark Zuckerberg didn't finish the risk. So we look for students who are willing to create something and create to start a business as is well creative. And we said, what's the problem with all the students? They are not allowed to establish a company in the students' hostel, nor in their apartment. And this was the original idea of the ICA, just stable garages. And uh, with this idea, we approached architects, we approached developers, and we said, this is the experiment. We want to start how to merge the real life, because there is Daniel, and I'm allowed to say that, Daniel is uh, one of the founders of Native Instruments. The Native Instrument was invented actually in two places, on a dance floor in a club, because this is the market leader of electronic instruments. Invented in Berlin on a dance floor, on the table in the kitchen. And this is how we create business. And this is what we want to create a place there to create stories like this. And we have many stories like this. I can tell you honestly, the city doesn't understand this approach. It's not the task of the city to understand this approach. And I like what you said, don't touch the video fish. Just let them, let them do it. What we are doing is we think, living and working together under one roof for for a very specific topic, for people who want to do things. And yes, you're right. Just, just do it. This is a spirit. And we should preserve this spirit. This is actually the story of Edward. We have many, many answers to questions we just learn in a different way. Because we built this five high-rise building, 350,000 square feet, with a timber construction. Just Thank because you. it's sustainable, it makes sense. And this is, you find the answers in the process, and I like very much your approach. There is no master plan. You just need the framework for creativity. Thank you, Marvin. Um, we have to wrap up very soon, so I thank everyone for, for sharing their time, stories, and input to that. Um, bringing up Paul's question, bringing up with the heritage of, of, of the creatives and, and artists that started the revolution and the basic change. Nobody knows, we all know that it's, it's a different time and different solutions have to be found. We had on this uh, panel today um, a lot of interesting um, contributions, ideas towards that. Probably none of those is a universal answer, but everyone is definitely um, a very a very exciting contribution to, to, to go forward. So thank you very much again. Thank you for Anya and to Anya also for developing the program with me. Thank you to the sister cities of Los Angeles to, um, to support the panel. And um, I wish you everyone a fantastic evening still and